So I'd like at the end of this talk to describe some joint work with Bhargav Bhatt and Akhil Matthew about a new perspective on a mathematical object called the Durham bit complex in characteristic P algebraic geometry. But I would like to spend the beginning of the talk just providing a bit of context for what that is and why you might be interested in it. So let me start talking about the case of a smooth manifold. So if X is a smooth manifold, then for every non-negative integer K, you can look at differential forms of degree K on X, and I'm gonna mean complex value differential forms. And as K varies, these can be organized into a chain complex where the differential is exterior differentiation. And a classical theorem of Durham is that this chain complex, which is called the Durham complex, computes the cohomology of the manifold, which can be defined in many other ways. For example, the cohomology groups of this chain complex are the same as the singular cohomology groups of X with complex coefficients. So this is a story that you can tell for any smooth manifold, but I want to consider instead the case of a manifold which arises as an affine algebraic variety over the complex numbers, meaning a manifold, a complex manifold now, which can be embedded as a closed sub-manifold sub of C to the N, which is given as the system, the set of solutions to a system of polynomial equations, F1, F2, F3, and so forth. Now, if X comes to you as an affine algebraic variety, then it makes sense to talk about an algebraic differential form on X or a polynomial differential form. That means a differential form that can be written as a polynomial in the coordinate function zi and their differentials. So these algebraic differential forms form a subcomplex of the complex of all differential forms. And that subcomplex is much, much smaller. So for example, in degree zero, um, here on smooth differential forms, you'd see the collection of all smooth functions on x. And in this subcomplex, you would just see polynomial functions on x. But even though this complex is much, much smaller, a theorem of growth in Deke asserts that it has the same cohomology, where the, the inclusion of this subcomplex induces an isomorphism on cohomology. So combined with Durham's theorem, this tells you that you can compute the cohomology of the underlying topological space of X using this complex of algebraic differential forms. So just to get us all on the same page, let me do an example. Let's take uh, the complex numbers with the origin removed. So that's something that you can think of as an affine algebraic variety. You can embed it in C squared as the collection of pairs of complex numbers W and Z that satisfy the equation W times Z is equal to one. And now what are the algebraic differential forms? Those are differential forms that can be written as polynomials in W and Z, W is Z inverse here, and DW and DZ, but of course, a little bit of elementary calculus will tell you you can write DW in terms of DZ. And what does this complex look like? Well, there's two terms. The zero forms are just Laurent polynomials in Z, polynomials in Z and its inverse. And in degree one, you just see Laurent polynomials times the differential form DZ. And the differential here is familiar to anyone who's studied elementary calculus. The differential of z to the n is n times z to the n minus one dz. So the cohomology of this complex is very easy to compute. Note, there's a natural grading here where z and dz are considered to have degree uh, one. And each of the graded pieces of this complex or most of the graded pieces of this complex don't contribute anything to the cohomology. On the nth graded piece, the differential looks like multiplication by n. So as long as n is not zero, you, you won't see any cohomology. The only exception is when n is equal to zero. And in that, that contributes a one dimensional cohomology group in degree zero and one with the cohomology classes are represented by the differential forms one and dz over z. And this is the answer that is predicted by growth and Dijk's theorem. Note that uh, C star, it's homotopy equivalent to a circle. And so it ought to have cohomology groups in degrees zero and one. 
Okay, so why might you care about these algebraic differential forms? Well, one reason that you might care about them is if you want to actually get your hands on cohomology this way. So Durham's theorem is telling you that you can compute the cohomology of a manifold using its Durham complex. It's not really something that you can directly apply. You're not going to compute the cohomology of a manifold by writing a vector space basis for the collection of all differential forms, writing down all the matrix coefficients, and, and doing a calculation. That, that would be absurd, but if you restrict your attention to the algebraic differential forms, then it's no longer absurd. And in certain cases, that you can actually uh, see exactly what happens, like the case I described on the previous slide. Um, uh, Growth and Deke's theorem also has some not immediately obvious consequences for the structure of the cohomology. So for example, if you have an affine variety having complex dimension D, then the complex of algebraic differential forms is concentrated in degrees zero through D. And so its cohomology groups are also concentrated in degrees zero through D. But if X has complex dimension D, it also has real dimension twice D. So a priori, you might have expected its cohomology to lie in twice as many degrees. You might have expected, for example, to see some cohomology in degree 2D. Um, of course, this is an artifact of the fact that I'm talking about affine algebraic varieties, namely uh, things that are embedded as a closed subset of C to the N. If I was talking instead about projective algebraic varieties, they'd be uh, smooth manifolds, and, or sorry, compact manifolds, and this, uh, this vanishing would not be true anymore. But the main reason that you might care about algebraic Durham cohomology is that it's a purely algebraic construction. It gives you access to uh, the cohomology of an algebraic variety over the complex numbers that makes no use of the topology on the complex numbers. And therefore, it gives you a way of making sense of cohomology for varieties that are defined over other fields, fields that might not have a topology on them. So let me elaborate on that. So let's say R is any commutative ring, then you can associate to R what's called its algebraic Durand complex. So this is a, a ring which is generated by R together with some formal symbols, DF, where F ranges over the elements of R. And these symbols are required to satisfy some relations which enforce the usual rules of calculus. So D is supposed to be additive, D satisfies the Leibniz rule, and multiplication of, of one forms is, is uh, anti-commutative. Um, and then just a slight variant of this, if R contains a field K, you can talk about differential forms relative to K, which means you, you think of the elements of K as constant functions, and you impose the additional relation that the differential of a constant function is equal to zero. Are you assuming the thing in parentheses? Am I assuming? Uh, yeah, look, so if this thing in parentheses only matters if you're in characteristic two, um, but if you're in characteristic two, you should also demand this. Um, and so this, as the terminology suggests, this algebraic Durham complex is a complex. It has a differential, which is given by the usual rule for exterior differentiation. If you differentiate a form like this, you just uh, differentiate, take the differential of the function f0 and multiply it by the remaining terms. Okay, so this is a construction that you can apply to any commutative ring, but we're going to specialize it to commutative rings that arise in algebraic geometry. So let's say k is some field and X is a smooth affine variety over K. It means it's something which is described by a system of polynomial equations where the coefficients lie in K. So X can be described by specifying what's called its coordinate ring, which means you take the polynomial ring on whatever set of variables that you've given yourself, and you mod out by the ideal generated by the defining equations of X. And then this is a commutative ring, and you can look at its algebraic Durham complex relative to K. So this is a, an invariant of the variety X, 
which is called its algebraic Durham complex. And then you can look at the cohomology groups of that complex, and these are called the Durham cohomology groups of X. Now, this is a construction which was introduced by Grothendieck. And in these terms, we can restate Grothendieck's theorem is that when you're working over the complex numbers, these Durham cohomology groups of a variety recover the usual singular cohomology groups of the underlying topological space. Now, the, again, the virtue of this construction is it now makes sense for varieties over any field. And as long as you stick to fields of characteristic zero, it behaves more or less as you might expect. It produces vector spaces over the field K. If K is characteristic zero, those vector spaces are, are finite dimensional and their size in some sense reflects what you think the topology of X ought to look like. Uh, in the previous slide, the, yeah. um, like the R over K is the same thing as the one in the previous slide. Right? As, as, yes, exactly. But just we are restricting which rings we take. Yeah, exactly. This is a construction that you can always do, but um, you probably don't want to do it um, unless uh, the rings that you're applying it to feel like you're describing uh, functions on something smooth. Okay, but the rest for the rest of this talk, I want to talk not about fields of characteristic zero. I want to do algebraic geometry over fields of positive characteristic. And in this case, there's a few things that you might want to be aware of. So the first thing is that uh, over fields of characteristic zero, these Durham cohomology groups are always finite dimensional. But over fields of positive characteristic, they're essentially never finite dimensional, except in trivial cases. So for example, the calculation that we did when the variety was C star, we saw that the Durham cohomology had, or the, the Durham complex broke as a sum of pieces, where on the nth piece, the differential looked like multiplication by n. And that cohomology ended up being finite dimensional because the only piece that contributed to cohomology was the piece where n was equal to zero. But if we were working not over the complex numbers, but over a field of positive characteristic, we would see that multiplication by n was often the zero map whenever n was divisible by the characteristic. And so we would see some infinite dimensional cohomology groups show up. Um, and now this uh, infinite dimensionality, it's an artifact of the fact that I'm talking here about affine algebraic varieties. If I was instead to talk about projective algebraic varieties, things that behave as if they're compact, then we would see these cohomology groups again be finite dimensional. I'm going to stick to affine algebraic varieties for the sake of concreteness, but um, everything that I am going to say is makes sense for projective algebraic varieties too. Now, another thing that you should be aware of is that these uh, cohomology groups, they're again, always vector spaces over K. So if K is a field of characteristic P, these are abelian groups in which P is equal to zero. And this is something that you might not want. So for example, if you're growth and deep, then one of your motivations is to use these cohomology theories for algebraic varieties in order to prove the Vey conjectures. You want these cohomology, uh, cohomological invariants to give you a way of counting the number of solutions to polynomial equations over finite fields. And if your cohomological invariants only take values mod p, then uh, at best, you're going to be able to count the number of solutions to polynomial equations modulo p. So for this reason, it, um, one might be motivated to try to improve these invariants and somehow get away from the fact that they are vector spaces over K. But you're looking at, like if you start with K, which is a field with characteristic P greater than zero, isn't it already that P is equal to zero? Sorry, what yeah, yeah, that? so these, these vector spaces will all be, uh, sorry, these cohomology groups will all be abelian groups in which every element is P torsion. But oh, every, okay. if you consider that a problem, then maybe you should try to do something else. Try to improve these invariants, uh, refine them to something that doesn't have that feature. So let me describe a uh, first attempt to do this. So let's say X is an affine algebraic variety. For simplicity, let's say over the field FP, 
with p elements and let r be its coordinate ring. So r is an fp algebra and the drawn complex of r is, is also an fp algebra. And if you want to get invariants that are not p torsion, one thing that you might try to do is to take a, a lift of r to characteristic zero. And so what I mean by that is just a commutative ring that I'm going to note by r bar, which has no p torsion. But when you reduce it in mod p, you get the ring r back. So these lifts always exist when r is the coordinate ring of a smooth, smooth affine algebraic variety. The word smooth should be there. And how do you make them? Well, if x is something which is described by a system of polynomial equations, uh, those polynomials have coefficients mod p. Essentially, what you want to do is write those as the mod p reduction of uh, polynomials with integer coefficients. And those will describe a characteristic zero lift of r. And now, instead of considering the algebraic Durham complex of r, you can consider the algebraic Durham complex of this lift. And this is a complex such that when you reduce it mod p, you'll get the Durham complex of r back. So how this construction a priori depends on a choice, namely the choice of this lift. What can we say about that choice? Well, if r bar and r bar prime are two lifts of r, one can show they might not be the same, but you can show that they become isomorphic after periodically completing both of them. And motivated by that, you can consider <laughs> not the algebraic Durham complex of a lift, but its periodic completion. You can take the, the limit over n of the reduction of omega r bar mod p to the n. So this is something that I'm going to denote by a little hat, writing a little hat over it. I'll call this the completed Durham complex. And well, because of what I just said, if you have any two different lifts, they're isomorphic after p-adic completion. And as a consequence, these completed Durham complexes are also isomorphic. But a warning is that they're abstractly isomorphic, but there's no canonical isomorphism. And this is something that you should regard as very bad. Um, because it means that the construction of this chain complex it's not something that depends functorially on the algebraic variety that you started with. And as a, one concrete consequence of that is that it's really a construction that a priori only makes sense when X is an affine variety. And if you wanted to extend this, for example, to projective out varieties, you might run into some trouble because lifting to characteristic zero is something that you can always do for an affine variety, but not always for a projective variety. But something very magical happens, which is that even though this complex is not something that depends functorially on the variety X, it turns out that the cohomology groups of this complex do depend functorially on, on X and don't depend on the choice of lift. And this uh, phenomenon is the starting point for the theory of crystalline cohomology. So, Crystalline cohomology is an invariant introduced by Berthelot and Grothendieck. And to any smooth algebraic variety over FP or any perfect field of characteristic P, they assign cohomology groups called crystalline cohomology groups. And these have the following feature. Well, if X is an affine variety and you lift its coordinate ring to characteristic zero, then the crystalline cohomology groups of X are just the cohomology groups of this completed Durham complex. So it agrees with the construction that I outlined for you on the previous slides. But this is not the definition of the left-hand side. The definition of the left-hand side is something that does not depend on the choice of R bar. And the def moreover, it's something that makes sense even when X is not affine. It makes sense for things like projective varieties and depends functorially on the variety that you start with. So it's a very useful invariant with all sorts of wonderful properties. That's the good news. And what's the bad news is that 
I can't tell you the definition of crystalline cohomology in a colloquium talk. There's, there's some prerequisites that you need to absorb before you can um, make sense of this definition. So there's prerequisites of uh, sort of abstract nature. So you need to be familiar with the theory of sheath cohomology. And there's, even if you are familiar with the sort of abstract prerequisites, there's specific prerequisites for understanding this particular definition is a sort of chapter in a commutative algebra book that you probably would never be motivated to read unless you were interested in this specific construction, this theory of divided power ideas. Um, and I just want to contrast this with the situation of the algebraic Durham complex. The algebraic Durham complex is something that I can give you the definition of on one slide, and then you can write down your favorite algebraic variety by giving its defining equations and start trying to compute the cohomology of that complex. So some years afterwards, uh, another approach to crystalline cohomology was introduced, which is more in the spirit of the, uh, the algebraic Durand complex. So this was first Spencer Block in, in low dimensions and then Deline Illusi in arbitrary dimensions introduced an invariant called the Durand Witt complex. So, to a smooth affine variety with coordinate ring R, you can associate a chain complex, which is written as W omega R. Uh, that W is supposed to make you think of Witt vectors, in other words, of, of the idea of lifting to characteristic zero. And this W omega R has the following features. First of all, it's something that doesn't depend on auxiliary choices. It depends only on the input ring R. And it's something that's essentially described by generators and relations. And the cohomology groups of this complex are the crystalline cohomology groups of the variety X. So in particular, if you were to make the choice of a characteristic zero lift of R, then the Durand Witt complex is a complex which has the same cohomology as this completed Durand complex, but the complexes themselves are not the same. Okay, so that's the good news. It's a very explicit approach to crystalline cohomology. But what's the bad news? The bad news is that the Durand Witt complex is extremely complicated. So the Durand complex, you might think, well, it's something that you would expect to look complicated if your variety is complicated. But if you took a simple algebraic variety, like an affine space, where the coordinate ring is a polynomial ring, then the Durand complex is just something that you can understand very explicitly. But the Durand Witt complex, even for a polynomial ring in two variables, is, is, is quite difficult to describe. Uh, and moreover, I mean, it's something that you can describe. And at least in Illusi's approach, it's something that you have to describe before you can check that this construction has the properties that you want. So proofs of the essential properties of this complex rely on uh, explicit calculations for simple rings like polynomial rings. And those explicit calculations are uh, quite elaborate. So what I want to do with the rest of this lecture is describe some joint work with Bargov Bot and Akhil Matthew which gives a, an alternative construction of this Durand Witt complex. And it, just, it's going to be the same complex. So it's going to be just as hard to describe explicitly what you get. But the virtue of the alternative approach is that it allows you to uh, establish some of the properties that this complex is supposed to have without really engaging with the calculations. You don't need to know what the Durand Witt complex looks like for a polynomial ring in order to know um, that it, for example, is related to crystalline cohomology. All right, so what I would like to do now is sketch for you construction of this complex. And I'm going to start by giving you a bad construction. I'm going to give you a construction that makes some auxiliary choices. So let's, for the rest of this lecture, X is going to be a, a smooth affine variety over a perfect field K. Uh, R is going to denote the coordinate ring. And we're going to fix a characteristic zero lift of R that I denote by R bar. 
And now I'm going to do something which is even worse, which is I'm going to choose on R bar what's called the lift of Frobenius, meaning that means a ring homomorphism from R bar to itself, denoted by phi, that has the property that phi of x is congruent to x to the p mod p. And just a remark, this is something that you can always do when, at least when R bar is piadically complete. But now it's not something that's necessarily unique. You're really making choices here. Um, but this phi in particular, it's a ring homomorphism from R bar to itself, and it induces a map from the Durham complex of R bar to itself. And concretely, what do you do if you want to apply phi to a differential form? You just apply phi individually to each um, each of the elements of R that appears in the definition of that differential form. Now, I just want to make an observation. If you have an element of, oh, sorry, that should say R bar. Any element of R bar satisfies phi of x is congruent to x mod p. So if I differentiate that, d phi of x is congruent to d of x to the p mod p, but d of x to the p is divisible by p. So that's actually congruent to zero mod p. And a consequence is that the action of this phi on differential forms of degree n is always divisible by p to the n. And you can define what's called the, the divided Frobenius. This is a map from the Durham complex to itself, which on a differential form, it looks like you apply phi to each component, but you divide by uh, the degree p to the degree of the differential form. Uh, and just a warning, this F, it's a map from the Durham complex to itself, but it's not a map of chain complexes, right? The map phi on, of the previous slide, that was a map of chain complexes. This F is obtained from phi by uh, dividing by a different power of P in every degree. So it, it's not a map of chain complexes, but it fails to be in a very specific way. Namely, if you want to differentiate F of X, you get f of dx times p. OK, I just want to take this uh, structure that we saw on this slide and axiomatize it. So definition, a Dudenne algebra is a, it's a chain complex with a uh, multiplication satisfying the Leibniz rule, what's called a differential graded algebra together with a ring homomorphism F from A to itself, satisfying a couple of conditions. One is on elements of degree zero, F, F of X is congruent to X to the P mod P. Two is it's gonna be concentrated in non-negative degrees. And three is the, the equation that we had at the end of the last slide. F is not a map of chain complexes, but it it fails to be in this very specific way. And the main example, of course, is that if we have a, if we're in the situation of choosing a characteristic zero lift, then it's completed Durham complex is a Dudenne algebra. And the reason I wanna introduce this definition is that the Durham bit complex, which I haven't defined for you yet, it's also going to be a Dudenne algebra, and it's gonna be obtained from this one by fixing it. That is, this, this student A algebra is going to have a problem, and we're going to fix that problem and get something else. Excuse me, your, your student A algebra over what kind of field is that an algebra? Well, it doesn't, the definition doesn't require that you fix, yeah, th this isn't over a field. This, um, th this will always be a, a mixed characteristic object. Um, this will be like an algebra over Z or over. You might as well piadically complete, so it could be an algebra over ZP if you want. Okay, so let me make an observation. Suppose that we've got a Dudenne algebra A, and let X be an element, and suppose that X has the form F of Y. So then if I differentiate X, that's a D of F of Y, and because of the uh, property three appearing in the definition, that's P times something else. And now I wanna ask if the converse holds. That is, if I have an element X such that 
dx is divisible by p, is it necessarily true that I can write x as f of something? So the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. Let me make that into a definition. I'll say that a Dudenne algebra is saturated if for every element x such that dx is divisible by p, there's a unique element y such that f of y is equal to x. And um, second condition, just to make what I'm about to say correct, is I want to demand that there's no p torsion and you can kind of ignore that. Okay, so this is a condition and the examples that we've seen so far will essentially never satisfy this condition. So let's do an example. So suppose that you've started by with where your algebraic variety X was the affine line. So the coordinate ring of the affine line is a polynomial algebra in one variable, let's say over FP. And then you can lift that to characteristic zero by taking a polynomial algebra in one variable, but now over the integers. And that has a lift of Frobenius given by the homomorphism, which carries T to T to the P. And now in this ring, you, you can consider the element P times T. And if I differentiate that in the drum complex, of course, I'm gonna get something which is divisible by P. But note that this element P times T, that's not in the image of the Frobenius map phi. It's not something that you can write as a polynomial in the variable t to the p. So that means that this completed Durham complex is not saturated in the sense of the previous slide. Um, but if you think of that as a problem, well, it's a problem that you can fix. So if you have any Dudenne algebra A, then you can make it saturated. So essentially, what do you have to do every time that you see an element x such that d of x is divisible by p, you need to add to it an element y satisfying f of y is equal to x. So what, what would that mean in this case? In this case, you would see that there was this element p times t whose derivative was divisible by p. And then you would need to add, you need to write that as f of some new element that was added. And that new element deserves to be called p times t to the one over p. So that's an element which doesn't live in the original ring. It's something that you have to add in order to make this DNA algebra saturated. And now maybe the rough slogan of what I'm gonna say next is that the difference between this completed Durham complex and the Durham bit complex is this property of being saturated. That the Durham bit complex is what you get by taking the completed Durham complex and then applying this procedure. Now that's not quite right. There's one other thing that you have to do in order to, uh, for that to be a correct statement. So let's suppose that A now is a saturated Dudenne algebra and let X be any element. Well, of course, if you differentiate P times X, you're gonna get a multiple of P. So since A is saturated, that means there's a unique element Y such that F of Y is P times X. And that construction that takes X and assigns Y, that gives you a group homomorphism from A to itself. I'll denote that by V, this is called the, the Verschiebel map. And just a, a definition, um, let A be a saturated Dudenne algebra. I want to, you can always make a new one where you essentially complete with respect to V. So what I mean is you take, <laughs> For any n, you can look at the subcomplex generated by elements of the form v to the n times x, and then you take the inverse limit as n varies of a mod these subcomplexes. So let me call this the completion of a, and we'll say that a is strict if this completion procedure doesn't change a, if, if it maps isomorphically to its completion. Okay, so with these definitions in hand, I can tell you what the durham bit complex is. Um, so again, let X be a smooth variety, let R be its coordinate ring. Now here's the construction. First, you lift R to characteristic zero with a lift of Frobenius. Then you take this Durham complex of the lift. That, that's now a Dudenne algebra, which is essentially never gonna be saturated. So you, you take the saturation. And this is a saturated Dudenne algebra 
And then you apply the construction of the previous slide to make it complete with respect to V. And you get what, uh, what I'm there feeling here you constructing with this uh, saturation, it could be a very, very large thing. Now. It's going to be a very large thing, yes. Not too large. It, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> it's going to be the size that you want if. Well, you're going to show it's the same as the other definition. I, well, not. I'm going to show some things depending on how much time we have. <laughs> it looks like I have plenty of time. Okay. Yeah. Can you give a flavor of what the elements look like here? Because when you complete. Yeah, so, so the elements. So, I, I would advise you to ignore this slide. So, this this slide is necessary for me to be making correct statements. But I want you to think morally. The the procedure that you're applying is this one. So, you start with the Durham complex, which is kind of generated by elements in the coordinate ring of the lift and their derivatives. And then you need to add new elements to it. Um, essentially, you know, you need to add F inverse of X whenever X is something that satisfies P divides D times X. And yes, when you do this, you will add lots of things. Um, okay, so this is a construction. And this is, I'm calling this a definition. This is a bad definition. This is exactly what I said we wanted to avoid because it's making our auxiliary choices. We really want something that depends only on R. Um, but now what I want to explain is that these auxiliary choices are not necessary. That this is something which depends only on R and is functorial. And the reason for that is going to be that this um, Durham bit complex is something that satisfies a universal property that can be formulated, mentioning only the ring R. So I want to do a warm up. I want to talk not about the Durham bit complex, but about the classical algebraic Durham complex. So let R be a commutative ring. And then you have this algebraic Durham complex, omega star of R. And this is an example of a commutative differential graded algebra. So that means it's a chain complex equipped with a multiplication where the differential satisfies the Leibniz rule. And in the world of commutative differential graded algebras, it's equipped with, it has a certain universal property. So let A star be any commutative differential graded algebra. Then if you want to describe a homomorphism from the Durham complex of R into A, you only have to say what it does in degree zero. The data of a homomorphism of differential graded algebras is the same as the data of a ring homomorphism from R into A zero. Because as soon as you know where every element of R is going, you also know where the differentials of those elements are going. Because this, um, this map has to be a map of chain complexes. If you know where x goes, you also know where to send dx. Just see where x goes and apply the differential. And the relations defining the Durham complex are not going to cause any problems because those relations were all essentially encoded by the, in the definition of a commutative differential graded algebra. So this is a sort of prototype for a statement that I want to make about this Durham bit complex. So now let X be a smooth affine variety over a perfect field K of characteristic P. Let R be its coordinate ring. And this Durham bit complex, as I mentioned earlier, it's an example of a strict Dudenne algebra. And in the world of strict Dudenne algebras, it has a universal property, which is analogous to the previous slide. So let A be any strict Dudenne algebra, then giving a map of Dudenne algebras from the Durham bit complex into A, it's determined by a ring homomorphism from R, now not into A0, but into a certain quotient of A0. A0 modulo the image of this Bershiba map. What is the strict Dudenne algebra? What's that? What's the strict? So a strict Dudenne algebra, it's, it's a Dudenne algebra which is saturated and has the further property that when you do this completion procedure, when you complete with respect to V, that you don't change it. 
Okay, so let me sketch for you a proof of this theorem or what, what the, the steps are. All right, so let A be a strict Dudenne algebra. We're interested in understanding Dudenne algebra homomorphisms from this Durham Vit complex into A star. So, how is the left hand side defined? Remember, this was constructed by first choosing a lift of R to characteristic zero with a lift of Frobenius, taking the Durham complex of the lift, which was a Dudenne algebra, and then forcing that Dudenne algebra to become strict. And what I mean by forcing the commutative Dune algebra to become strict is that homomorphisms from the drum bit complex into something which are strict should be the same as homomorphisms from this completed Durham complex into A. So this is essentially by construction. Now, th there's a little hat here. The hat, remember, indicates that you've periodically completed something, and that's not important at all. Um, a is a strict Dudenne algebra. It's sort of complete with respect to the Verschiebung, and that in particular implies that it's periodically complete. So periodic, it doesn't really matter whether you complete the left-hand side or not. You know, the same as Dudenne algebra homomorphisms from omega star of R bar into A. And now I want to, uh, we're in a situation where we're looking at maps out of the Durham complex. And remember, the algebraic Durham complex has a certain universal property. If you want to uh, compute maps into another differential graded algebra, you just have to know what the map is doing in degree zero. And well, here we're interested not just in maps of differential graded algebras, we're in interested in maps of Dudenne algebras, which means differential graded algebras that also have this operation F. And the upshot is these homomorphisms will just be given by ring homomorphisms from R bar into A0 that are compatible with what F is doing in degree zero. So here I'm using the universal property that I mentioned on the previous slide. And now maybe the point where you have to do the most work is to observe that a ring homomorphism from R bar into A0, if it's compatible with the Frobenius, then it's determined by what it does after you mod out by the image of the Verschiebung. And so to prove this, I'm using something about what strict Dudenne algebras look like. More specifically, I'm, I'm using the fact that the definition of a strict Dudenne algebra forces A0 to look like a ring of Vit vectors. Or specifically, it looks like the ring of Vit vectors of the quotient of A0 by the image of the Verschiebel map. And then this identification between these two kinds of maps follows from a, a universal property of the Vit vector construction. And now we're essentially done. This looks like it depends on R bar, but A0 mod the image of V, that's a ring in which P is equal to zero. Right? P, the element P in A0 is V of one. So any ring homomorphism from R bar into this quotient ring automatically factors through R bar mod P, which is the ring R. So this is a sketch of a proof that identifies these Dudenne algebra homomorphisms with ring homomorphisms from R into this quotient. And what's the upshot of this discussion? Well, let's suppose that X is a smooth algebraic variety coordinate ring R. This completed Durham complex of a lift depends on some choices, but once you doctor it to enforce this uh, saturated condition and this completion condition, you get something that depends only on R because it has a universal property which can be stated without reference to the choices that you made. In other words, it's an invariant of the algebraic variety X that you started with. Okay, but now that's probably not all you want to know. So for example, a priori, it could just be the zero ring, right? The zero ring doesn't depend on um, any choices either. Is it a useful invariant of the algebraic variety X? And the answer is yes. And one articulation of this is that it does the job that I mentioned earlier. It's a, uh, it's a chain complex, which depends only on R 
whose cohomology is the same as the Durham, completed Durham cohomology of any lift of r to characteristic zero. Um, and more specifically, if you, uh, if you build this Durham fit complex via the procedure that I described, then the natural, it comes with a map from this completed Durham complex. That map is not an isomorphism, but it induces an isomorphism on cohomology. Let's see how much time. Oh, well, I had much more time than I expected. So um, let me just sketch a little bit of what goes into the proof of this, and then I'll conclude. Um, so again, the advertisement I want to make is that uh, the approach that I'm describing lets you prove this theorem without really knowing what the drawn bit complex looks like. Okay, so I want to just go on a brief digression, right? Of course, if there was no difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, then that map is going to be an isomorphism on cohomology. The difference comes about essentially because this student A algebra fails to be saturated. So let's take a look at how bad the situation is. How badly does this completed Durham complex fail to be saturated? So let me remind you of the definition. So let me denote this completed Durham complex by A. So you have this divided Frobenius, which is a map from A to itself, but it lands in a subset of A. It lands in the set of X such that DX is divisible by P. And for A to be saturated, this map up top would have to be an isomorphism. Now, to say that dx is divisible by p, that's saying that if I look at x not as an, think of x not as an element of a, but look at its image in a mod p, then it's a cycle. It's something which is, mod p is annihilated by the differential. And so actually there's a commutative diagram here where we can put the mod p reduction of a and then cycles in the mod p reduction of a. And well, if A was saturated, then this map up top would have to be a surjection. And in particular, this map on the bottom would also have to be a surjection. But this map on the bottom is essentially never a surjection. However, it fails to be a surjection in a very specific and quantifiable way. So this A mod P, just remember, a is this completed Durham complex. When you reduce it mod P, you get the Durham complex of the original R. That's a complex of FP vector spaces. And well, when you apply this Frobenius, you get cycles in this Durham complex mod P. And every cycle represents a cohomology class. So there's a map from A mod P to the cohomology of A mod P. That's the Durham cohomology of R. So this construction has a name. This composite map is called the inverse Cartier isomorphism. And it gets that name because it is an isomorphism. So this is a, a funny fact of characteristic P geometry that I kind of alluded to earlier when I told you that for an affine variety in characteristic P, the Durham cohomology is essentially never going to be finite dimensional. In fact, the Durham cohomology is the same size as the Durham complex itself. There's an isomorphism between them that you can write down, which is given by this construction. So this tells you in particular, this is not going to be a surjection. The, the, this map here on the bottom, it's going to be an injection and its image is going to be uh, complementary to the boundaries in that Durham complex. Okay, so this is a, a funny fact about differential forms and characteristic P and Going back to the theorem that I stated on the previous slide, that funny fact is the only input that you need. So my statement is, um, if you look at the Durham complex of the lift, that maps to this Durham bit complex, I claim that it's an isomorphism on cohomology. I'm not gonna give you the proof, but I've, let me make a more general statement that if this is a consequence of, is that if you take any Duden A algebra, which is p-adically complete, you can ask if that Duden-A algebra satisfies the Cartier isomorphism. That is, if you do this construction for A, do you get an isomorphism? 
And if so, then mapping A to this completed saturation gives you an isomorphism on cohomology. So knowing that this particular complex has a Cartier isomorphism, that has to do with algebraic geometry. It has to do with differential forms and characteristic P. But if you black box it, the statement that I'm making here, it doesn't have to do with anything. This is something which is uh, an elementary bit of homological algebra. It has nothing to do with algebraic geometry or with differential forms. And it doesn't even have to do with the algebra structure on A star. It's just a fact about chain complexes equipped with a map F that satisfies that equation df is p times fd. And I think that I will stop there. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Are there questions? Can you compute an example for us? <laughs> um, the example of a polynomial ring on one generator is not too bad. So uh, let's go back to uh, let's go back to this. All right. So if you take a polynomial ring on one generator. Um, so you, what would the construction say to do? So you would start with the Durand complex of Z brackets T. That's really easy, right? That's just Z brackets T in degree zero and Z brackets T DT in degree one. Um, or I should periodically complete that, but let's ignore that. But then that's a Dudenay algebra, which is not saturated. So you have to saturate it. And what that means is you have to add things to it that are like, p times t to the one over p. And you have to add things, uh, if you sort of adding something like this doesn't make it saturated. Now you have a new problem, which is that p squared times t to the one over p is an element such that its derivative is divisible by p. And so you have to write that as the Frobenius of something. So you have to add to it something like p squared times t to the one over p squared. And so that gives, a sense of what it looks like. It's, it's kind of like you took the Durham complex and you added to it uh, these kind of things. Um, now, this is uh, what happens for a polynomial ring in one generator. For a polynomial ring in two generators, it's more complicated. And one way of expressing that it's more complicated is that if you look at the Durham complex, not the Durham bit complex, then the Durham complex on a polynomial ring on two generators can be described by taking the Durham complex of a polynomial ring on one generator and tensoring with itself. The formation of the Durham complex compute, commutes with tensor products. And so once you understand what it looks like for one generator, you sort of know what it looks like in general. But um, this saturation process, it behaves in a very complicated way with respect to tensor products. And so even for a polynomial ring with two generators, you really have to do some work in order to know what it looks like. Can I ask you a question that I asked Varga at the end of his lectures last week? Uh -huh. Word crystal and the word prism, what, where are they coming from? Crystalline cohomology, prismatic cohomology. Um, well, maybe, maybe the first one is to Pierre. I mean, Pierre is more qualified to answer this question. I can, I can say my understanding, I mean, this was introduced before I was born. So uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's good my to understanding see is that it's motivated by this uh, idea that this is a science experiment where you, you have like a, a solution and uh, with, with some salt dissolved in it and you dip a string in it and you leave it alone for a little while and you pull it out and this kind of crystal made of salt has grown, grown on your string. And I think that the, the word crystalline is supposed to suggest an analogy with that, where the string is like your algebraic variety and the, the thing that's growing on it is, is the, well, okay. the, the sheaf that you're taking the cohomology of. Prism? 
I think PRISM was intended to um, first to evoke crystal. Um, it was supposed to sort of rhyme with uh, crystal and crystal and cohomology. Um, and it was also supposed to evoke the idea that it's something that you can look at from a lot of different angles. Right. I think for crystal, it's not a string in a liquid, but already small crystal which grows and keep the same shape when it grows in this uh -huh. liquid. That's a question. Great. I'd like to thank the speaker again for a very interesting talk. Thank you very much.